Scientists from the European Space Agency are putting the final touches to a pioneering mission to Jupiter's icy moons in the hope of finding signs of primitive life. Jupiter has a jaw-breaking quality. If you were to dig deep below the whirling clouds, you'd find several unusual kinds of hydrogen stacked one on top of the other. I think so, yes. I think, to be honest, it's fair to say some of these images have pretty much knocked the socks off some of the scientists. Um, they're all saying uh, James Webb is performing even better than it. However, what lies at its core? What exactly is Jupiter made of on the inside? Could it be chameleons, candy, cake, cheddar, chemtrails? It is unknown. Nobody ever knows. That's not even close to being true, let alone totally true. With 2.5 times the mass of all the other planets combined, Jupiter is the biggest planet in the solar system. Like Neptune, Saturn, and Uranus, it is a gas giant. About 90% of it is hydrogen and 10% is helium, with the remaining trace elements being water, ammonia, methane, and other substances. Under Jupiter's enormous pressure and temperatures, substances that would gas on Earth exhibit highly unusual behaviors. Now, for the first time, a NASA satellite has discovered something significant occurring on Jupiter. What is this discovery from our solar system's largest planet? If you could explore Jupiter, what would you find? Join us as we explore how NASA spacecraft circling Jupiter has just detected something huge happening for the first time. NASA's Juno spacecraft has just accomplished something extraordinary. It's entered the orbit around Jupiter and will get closer to the giant planet than ever before. An image was captured by a spacecraft flying 19,000 feet above Jupiter's cloud and was provided by NASA. Lightning in clouds carrying an ammonia and water mix is responsible for the green light, according to scientists. Lightning strikes on Earth are caused by clouds that contain water vapor. On Jupiter, however, it occurs because of a mixture of ammonia and water. This image was captured on December 30, 2020, during the spacecraft's 31st flyby as part of the Juno mission. In August 2011, NASA began its Juno mission to explore Jupiter by sending a spacecraft into space. And liftoff of the Atlas V with Juno on a trek to Jupiter a planetary piece of the puzzle on the beginning of our solar system. It arrived in July 2016 and has been continuing its mission for quite some time. It's probable that Jupiter's research will continue until at least 2025. The Juno mission analyzed the planet's magnetic and gravitational fields in addition to its chemical makeup. It has also gathered information that will be useful to researchers studying Jupiter's wind, water content, and the formation of the planet's rocky interior. In 1995, NASA sent the Galileo orbiter to Jupiter, which was fueled by nuclear energy and remained in orbit until 2003. Furthermore, recent findings from the Juno mission's ultraviolet spectrograph instrument indicate, for the first time, the genesis of auroral dawn storms, the distinctive brightening of Jupiter's aurorae that occurs early in the morning. These gigantic, fleeting bursts of light have previously been seen solely by ground-based and Earth-orbiting telescopes, most notably NASA's Hubble Space Telescope. They occur at both of Jupiter's poles. Hubble Space Telescope has a mirror that's eight feet. Hubble's faint object camera first spotted Jupiter's dawn storms in 1994 which are brief but strong brightening and broadening of the planet's primary auroral oval, which is the rectangular curtain of light that surrounds Jupiter's poles. Juno is the first spacecraft to provide a frontal picture of Jupiter's ultraviolet aurora, previously only visible from the side. If you want to observe the night side of Jupiter's poles while watching the aurora, you can't look at Jupiter from Earth. Voyager, Galileo and Cassini all explored, but they did so from great distances and didn't visit the Poles, thus their data was incomplete. That's why the Juno data is so essential. It sheds light on the dark side, where the day's first storms form. Researchers discovered that the gas giant's dark side is where dawn storms form. As Earth spins, 
the approaching dawn storm moves to the dayside, where the already brilliant Aurora Borealis brightens further, releasing hundreds of gigawatts to thousands of gigawatts of ultraviolet light into space. This increase in luminosity suggests that early morning storms on Jupiter are injecting at least 10 times as much energy into the planet's upper atmosphere as is seen during the average aurora. According to Zhang Hua Yao, a co-author of the study from the University of Liège, when we looked at the whole dawn storm sequence, we couldn't help but notice that they are very similar to a type of terrestrial auroras called substorms. Short-lived disturbances in the magnetosphere release energy high in Earth's ionosphere, causing substorms. Considering how drastically different Jupiter's and Earth's magnetospheres are, the striking similarities between their substorms are startling. The interaction between the solar wind, the stream of charged particles coming from the Sun, and Earth's magnetic field is the primary factor governing the magnetosphere on Earth. Particles emitted by Io, Jupiter's volcanic moon, become ionized in the gas giant's magnetic field and become stuck there. To better understand how this most beautiful of planetary phenomena occurs in worlds both within and beyond our solar system, these new insights will allow scientists to examine the differences and similarities driving the development of aurora. Jupiter's incredible strength is something to behold. These morning auroras are a further indication of the enormous power of our planet. The Juno mission is continuously rewriting the book on how big planets work. And these new findings about dawn storms are only the latest example. Thanks to NASA's recent mission extension, we can anticipate even more exciting findings in the future. When, if ever, will humans travel to Jupiter and other gas giants? Is it reasonable to think that we might one day be able to get close to the atmosphere of a gas giant like Jupiter once we've passed the asteroid belt? In what form would that take exactly? Even though Jupiter, like the other gas giants, has no solid surface, it is not a mere cloud floating aimlessly in space. The gas, predominantly helium and hydrogen, becomes denser, and the pressures more intense as one descends through the atmosphere from the upper to lower levels rapidly increasing heat. The Galileo Mission, launched by NASA in 1995, sent a probe into Jupiter's atmosphere, where it disintegrated at a depth of around 75 miles. The pressures here are more than a hundred times higher than those on Earth's surface. The innermost layers of Jupiter, about 13,000 miles down, with temperatures hotter than the surface of the Sun, and pressure two million times that of sea level on Earth. Therefore, it's safe to assume that no human will ever be able to explore Jupiter's interior in any great detail. But would it be risky to just go into orbit around the planet? A space station in orbit might be possible, right? Well, radiation is a further major issue when talking about Jupiter. Planet Earth has the strongest magnetosphere of any planet in the solar system. Particles in the area get electrically charged and are accelerated to high velocities by these magnetic fields, which can quickly destroy a spacecraft's electronics. Engineers on space missions must determine an orbit and spaceship layout that will lessen passengers' exposure to harmful radiation. Although NASA solved this problem with the continually rotating triple-array Juno spacecraft, it appears that this design is not suitable for human spaceflight. Instead, a crewed spaceship would need to remain a rather large distance away from Jupiter in order to safely orbit or fly past the planet. Not every gas giant in our solar system has this feature, but they all share additional difficulties that would prevent people from getting close to them. The winds on Neptune, for example, can reach speeds of up to 1,100 miles per hour, making it the solar system's windiest planet. Neptune and Uranus are both considered ice giants due to the presence of compounds and elements heavier than helium and hydrogen on their surfaces. These denser elements may make it significantly more dangerous for a spaceship to enter these atmospheres, as the spacecraft may sustain damage much more quickly. 
Even though Saturn's magnetosphere is smaller than Jupiter's, it is still 578 times stronger than Earth's, making radiation a major problem. Any close examination of the gas giants will have to be conducted by robotic spacecraft until we discover how to construct a spaceship employing materials that could shield human astronauts from all these components. Meanwhile, Jupiter's huge icy moons are a relatively safe bet if you're looking for life beyond our solar system. Researchers think that beneath the thick ice sheets that cover them, massive oceans lay, kept liquid by the jostling of Jupiter's enormous gravitational field. On Earth, we've learned that water is a prerequisite for life. Currently, the only places in the solar system where liquid water can be found are Earth and the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. Cassini-Huygens, a joint project between NASA and the European Space Agency, explored the outer planets of Saturn in great detail from 2004 to 2017, but there may be more to discover. Jupiter is currently the focus of attention. There will soon be a new mission to the largest planet in our solar system to learn more about the habitability of its moons. Launch of the European Space Agency's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, JUICE, aboard an Ariane 5 rocket from French Guiana, South America, is on. The eight-year journey to Jupiter for the six-ton JUICE spacecraft, which will use gravitational aids from Earth, Venus, and Mars to conserve fuel, will begin in 2026. The solar-powered machine is scheduled to arrive in July 2031, at which time it will direct its 10 science instruments toward Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, the three largest moons of Jupiter that are believed to have subterranean oceans. The largest moon in our solar system, Ganymede, is where JUICE will focus its efforts. In 2034, following its initial survey, the spacecraft will enter orbit around the planet. We're trying to characterize what the habitability of Ganymede might be, said Emma Bunce of the University of Leicester in England, who is a member of the JUICE team. The European Space Agency isn't the only organization aiming for Jupiter. In 2008, as part of NASA's Europa-Jupiter system mission, EJSM, the idea that would become JUICE was conceived. In this international initiative, Europe would create a spacecraft aimed at Ganymede, and NASA would make a probe aimed at Europa. Our understanding of Jupiter and its satellites stands to gain a great deal from these two missions. The spacecraft will provide insight into whether or not life could exist in the mysterious oceans underneath the surface of some of these worlds, paving the way for future missions to search for direct evidence of life. Even though interstellar travel is now impossible, Jupiter may provide the next best thing. The planetary system of Jupiter, especially its four largest moons, the Galilean moons, named for the Italian scientist Galileo Galilei, who discovered them in 1610, are sometimes compared to a miniature solar system because of their complexity and diversity. The discovery of objects orbiting something other than the Sun or Earth was a major paradigm shift, lending credence to the Copernican view that the universe is not centered on Earth. We now know that Jupiter has 92 natural satellites. Perhaps not even Galileo could have predicted how important his moons would become in the search for extraterrestrial life 400 years later. NASA's Pioneer 10 spacecraft was the first to explore Jupiter and its moons. The spacecraft made its historic flyby of the planet in December 1973, giving us our first up-close look at the spectacular gas giant. Even more incredible was the flyby performed by NASA's Voyager 1 spacecraft in March of 1979. Images from the probe showed that Europa's icy surface was brilliant and relatively free of craters, suggesting that the moon undergoes some sort of resurfacing process to keep its crust in pristine condition. Since water is essential to life on Earth, scientists reasoned that the greatest bet was a hidden reserve of liquid water beneath the surface. As the first spacecraft to enter Jupiter's orbit in December 1995, NASA's Galileo mission made a number of important findings, including the fact that Jupiter's third largest moon, Io, 
is the most volcanically active globe in the solar system. The Galileo probe discovered evidence of a liquid churning beneath Europa's surface in 1996, when it observed disturbances in Jupiter's magnetic field. Hubble Space Telescope Observations of plumes of water vapor emanating from Europa's surface 20 years later provided the strongest evidence yet for the Moon's subsurface ocean. Before the 2016 launch of NASA's Juno mission, no previous probe had ever completed an orbit of Jupiter. Juno is still active today, but it is now orbiting Jupiter in a sweeping arc to investigate the gas giant up close take pictures of its ferocious storms, and keep tabs on its enormous magnetic field. Images of Jupiter's moons have been captured by the spacecraft, but further exploration will require dedicated missions. Juice and Clipper are useful for this purpose. The SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket will carry the Clipper into orbit in the autumn of 2024. This spacecraft will arrive at Jupiter in April 2030, over a year before Juice did thanks to its more powerful launch vehicle and later launch date. Due to Europa's proximity to Jupiter, which brings it dangerously deep into Jupiter's radiation belts, JUICE will not orbit Europa as it will Ganymede. Instead, Clipper will undertake roughly 50 flybys of Europa as it circles Jupiter and its orbit, allowing it to scan Europa's innards and determine the size of its subsurface ocean. As Juice and Clipper execute a complicated waltz amongst Jupiter's attractions during their overlapping missions, they will have many chances to work together. It will be amazing to have two spaceships in the same solar system at the same time. Each spaceship may potentially serve as a lookout for the other. If there are truly plumes of liquid water erupting from breaches in the underlying ice, Juice may keep an eye on Europa from afar as Clipper prepares to fly past an invaluable alliance. Exploring these plumes may lead to the discovery of oceanic ejecta only minutes old. It's a great chance to look into something that's never been touched. Clipper's proximity to Europa would allow Juice to scan for plumes rising from the surface, directing the spacecraft's focus. If Juice were to find one, we'd know exactly where to go. Clippers might even happen to fly straight through some plumes giving us a chance to analyze the molecules in them for clues to the presence of life in Europa's ocean. Before orbiting Ganymede, JUICE will conduct its own set of two Europa flybys. In July 2032, a clipper flypast will occur only four hours after the next one. Scientists hunch that Europa's liquid water ocean is in direct contact with a rocky core contributes to the Moon's status as a shared focus. Hydrothermal vents, which are holes in the bottom through which heat rises, could provide the necessary energy and nutrients for life. Hydrothermal vents on Earth are home to diverse microbial populations. We have strong evidence that Europa is experiencing similar chemical processes. But because Ganymede is so much bigger than Europa, it's possible that a layer of denser ice has settled on the ocean floor and is blocking its vents. The rocky center may be safely encased. High-pressure ice cannot form on Europa because the moon is too small to generate sufficient gravitational and atmospheric forces. Nothing here should be taken to rule out the possibility of life on Ganymede, nor should it lessen the moon's scientific interest. After JUICE enters orbit around Ganymede in December 2034, it will conduct a comprehensive survey of the moon's surface investigate the moon's magnetic field, and make an attempt to create a map of the moon's subsurface water. Potentially habitable environments require a heat source, liquid water, organic material, and stability. Three are definitely present on Saturn's moon, Enceladus. We have a triad on Europa. We're on Ganymede, trying to get the answer. Starting out at a lofty 3,100 miles above Ganymede, JUICE will gradually decrease its orbital altitude over the course of nine months until it is only 125 miles above the Moon's surface. The spacecraft will be intentionally crashed on the surface in 2035 when the mission comes to a close to reduce the likelihood that any debris may contaminate Europa. If it turns out that Ganymede has plume activity or that its ice crust is unusually thin, 
the conclusion may need to be rethought to avoid contaminating Ganymede's liquid ocean as well. Clipper will deliver comparable data regarding Europa's ocean. However, it is not intended to locate conclusive proof of life. At best, it may detect the building blocks of life in the moon's plumes. It's possible that a subsequent mission, like NASA's highly anticipated Europa lander, would find signs of life. Scientists face their own difficulties in penetrating the miles-thick ice that covers this alien ocean if they want to take a bath there. In order to break through the icy surface, a lander could include a heat probe. A two miles tall column of cryogenic ice called the Europa Tower was used to recreate Europa's surface in an experiment headed by Paula Dovela Pereira of the Florida Institute of Technology last year to determine how long that may take. The clock isn't the only thing standing in the way. A major challenge for the future years, according to Vale Pereira, is determining how to have cables transport power and information between the lander and the probe. It is likely that the lander will need to bring many miles of cable with it, and this wire would need to be strong enough to withstand water refreezing as ice around it as the probe descends. However, there is immense scientific value in finding solutions to such issues, not the least of which is the possibility of inserting a machine into an alien ocean. Such hopes are really far-fetched. The only way we can make them happen is to travel to Jupiter and prove that its cold moons are as desirable as we think they are. The Galileo probe showed us that it's worth returning. What else might be habitable if life can make it here? Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.